As you probably know, the book that we receive our readings out of or that we proclaim our readings out of is called the lectionary. And this lectionary is divided into a three-year cycle of readings for Sundays. There's year A, B, and C. We're currently in year B. And so in year B, most of the gospel readings are taken from the gospel of Mark. But Mark is the shortest of all of the gospels. And so there's a need for supplemental selections taken from the other gospels in order to complete the year. And so this week and the next two weeks will actually be in the Gospel of John, and very specifically in John chapter 6. And it's significant that we are in John chapter 6, because John chapter 6 is where we get some deep theology about the Eucharist that we receive at the Mass. The body, blood, soul, and divinity that is made present by the prayers of the priest that comes upon the altar that we receive at the foot of the altar to be united to Christ. So over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to lay out the significance a little bit more so that we all can have this deeper and greater understanding of what is happening at the Mass and who we are receiving. St. Augustine said, the New Testament lies hidden in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is unveiled in the New Testament. The Old Testament being the first part of the Bible, the New Testament being the second part of the Bible. So when Jesus comes to us, he doesn't, he doesn't enter into history at a random time and a random place. The time and place is chosen by God for a specific purpose, to reveal to us his saving plan. His entrance into history as man reveals his desire to be in covenant with us, into that covenant union. Covenant is different than contract. Covenant is a family bond united that only death can bring about the end of that covenant. And so, all, and so Jesus comes to fulfill all of the prophecies of who the Messiah is and fulfills the covenants of the Old Testament and then begins and invites us into this new covenant in his life, live not for himself, but for each of us. So there's three things that we notice in today's gospel. First, the very obvious, that there's a large crowd that is following Jesus. And the reason given that they are following Jesus is because of the signs that he was performing, and par particularly the signs of the healing of the sick. The second thing we see is that Jesus goes up on a mountain, which seems like a simple fact. But when we get into it, we'll see why this is significant. And thirdly, the Jewish feast of Passover was near. Remember, the Passover is a celebration of the Israelites leaving the slavery in Egypt, crossing the Red Sea and entering into the wilderness, first and foremost to Mount Sinai, where they received the covenant of the Ten Commandments but then they are required to wander in the desert for 40 years because of their sin. But that Passover, we are near the Feast of Passover, and so it's very significant for our story today. So the Gospel shows us that those who come to Jesus on account of his miracles often possess a shallow interest in him because they really only see him as a wonder worker. We see this in John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. And then again in 4, 48. These reveal the intentions of the people who follow him. And these verses tell us that many are looking for signs. I think it's an opportunity for us to ask ourselves, why do we follow Jesus? Why are we here on Sunday morning? Why is that? Is it because of the signs that he is performing? Is it because we are raised this way? And this is just what we do because I was raised this, raised this way. Is it truly because we believe that Jesus is the Christ? Do we have a faith in which we are really only asking God for something, and if God doesn't give it to us, we no longer have any faith? Is he just some moral teacher that we have decided to align ourselves with? Or is he really the Christ? who has come to set us free from sin and death? The answer to this question 
means that we ought to align our life with, the, with this answer. And so all of the choices that we make need to flow from the answer to this question. And they ought to align with who we say that he is. Secondly, Jesus goes up on a mountain. This isn't something new to us. But we have heard Jesus going up to the mountain to pray and have rest. In fact, we just heard this a couple weeks ago. In this case, it becomes significant for what John is trying to reveal to us. Let us remember what St. Augustine said. The New Testament is hidden in the Old, and the Old Testament is unveiled in the New. And so let us remember the words that are chosen specifically by St. John. Details included because they reveal to us more of what is happening. These little details really are insignificant unless they play an important part in the story. Paper was expensive. They wouldn't have just included little details just to, just to include it like we would to embellish the story. But who else goes up on a mountain? Well, Moses goes up on the mountain. Moses goes up on the mountain to do what? To receive the Torah, to receive the law, and to give it to the Israelites. And when he goes up on the mountain and he's wandering, when he comes down from the mountain and they're wandering in the wilderness, what does Moses give the people to eat? He gives them bread from heaven. Jesus is aligning himself with Moses in this instant to fulfill the Old Testament, to fulfill the Old Covenant that God had made with the Israelites. Jesus is saying, I am the new Moses. I am the one who is to come. All of these are the things that Jesus is trying to reveal to us. He goes up on the mountain in another place as well, in Luke chapter 5, or Matthew chapter 5 and Luke 6, in order to give us the new law of the Beatitudes. And here he goes up the mountain again, and the large crowd follows him like all of the Israelites followed Moses into the wilderness. And so this leads us to our third point. The Jewish Passover feast was near. John is relating to us a spiritual relationship between Jesus and the Exodus, which is the origin of the Passover. In God's plan, especially in God's loving kindness for his people, he shows that he is providing for them. But Jesus says to Philip, where can we buy enough food? Looking at the crowds around them, Jesus says, where can we buy enough food for them to eat? And Philip says that 200 days wages wouldn't be enough to even buy them a small morsel. That's how large the crowd was. And then Andrew shows up with these five barley loaves, like that's going to help, five barley loaves. And two fish. But we know that this also is not going to feed the crowd. So Jesus is testing Philip and Andrew, testing their faith, testing them to not think just in material means, but in spiritual means as well. But also these five barley loaves should make our ears perk up a little bit. Because we also heard about five barley loaves in our first reading today. Remember in our first reading today, Elisha had 20 barley loaves. He had 20 barley loaves to feed 100 people. Jesus takes five barley loaves, less than even Elisha had, and he feeds 5,000 men. That doesn't include the women and children that were there as well. Jesus has less and he creates more, showing us that he is the fulfillment of the prophet Elijah. Remember that John the Baptist is like Elijah. He is the forerunner for the greater prophet who to, co- to come, who is going to be Elisha. John the Baptist is the forerunner of the greater man, the greater prophet to come, who is Jesus. And so Jesus is aligning himself with Elisha, and he's saying, I am even greater than the greatest of all of our prophets. He is the fulfillment of all of the prophets and all of their prophecies and reveals this through the works that he performs in our gospel today. So Jesus has the crowd recline on the grass. Once again, that's a small little detail that doesn't need to be added, but John adds. But this little detail should remind us of a psalm that we're very familiar with, Psalm 23, when the shepherd says, In green pastures 
he makes me lie down. The good shepherd who is Jesus is asking his people, his followers, to sit down, to recline in the grass. He's going to feed them as a shepherd feeds his sheep. Now John's gospel is different than the other three gospels in that it doesn't have what we call an institution narrative at the Last Supper. The institution narrative is when Jesus takes the bread, blesses it, and gives it to his disciples. He takes the chalice, he blesses it, and he gives it to his disciples. John's gospel doesn't have that narrative. But what John's gospel does have is this chapter here, John chapter 6. He says right here, he's near the Passover. Remember, the Last Supper was the Passover meal with Jesus and his disciples. Here they are at Passover. They're in the green grass. They're reclining just like the apostles reclined at the Last Supper. And here, once again, Jesus takes the loaves. He blesses them, gives thanks, and he distributes them. The same thing that he does at the Last Supper. John is trying to tell us to look at what is going to happen, what we know about the Last Supper, and here are some greater details about what Jesus is giving to us. But it's important for us to remember that it's not the apostles who are the source of the miracle. Jesus is the source of the miracle. He doesn't give the bread to his disciples to distribute to all of the people. At least it doesn't say that in this gospel. It says that he distributed them. Philip and Andrew see the very scant means to feed the crowd. But Jesus miraculously produces a superabundance, superabundance, and all were satisfied. We know that there is a superabundance because Jesus then goes and sends the disciples out to collect the fragments that are left over. And how many baskets of fragments are collected? Twelve. Is that significant? You bet it is. Because how many apostles are there? Twelve. It's a sign to us that Jesus is giving these fragments to the apostles to hand down to the people that they are to lead, to give them the bread from heaven as well. So the crowd recognizes these things. The crowd knows the story of Israel so well. They know the connection of Jesus feeding the crowd. They know like Moses feeding them with manna in the desert many, many years ago, they see all of this. The importance is not lost on them. They also knew the prophecies that a new Moses would come, one who would feed the people, the one who would feed the Israelites and lead the Israelites out of slavery into freedom. And so they've been looking for this new Moses. They've been looking for their Messiah. Moses gave them manna. Jesus gives them bread. But unlike the manna, if you remember the story about the manna, the manna would perish. The Israelites would gather as much as they needed for that day, but overnight it would perish. It would spoil. They couldn't use it the next day. To show them they were to depend on God every single day for everything in their life. But here, what does Jesus say? He says, collect the fragments lest they perish. The bread that Jesus gives will not perish. The life that he wants to give us will not end. He gives us eternal life. And so we will later see that he gives us bread from heaven that does not perish. As we continue in this gospel over the next couple weeks, he gives us his body and he gives us the bread of life. Now those that are following Jesus on this day, they're, they're seeing all this, they're recognizing all of these signs, and they say, let's make him our king. He is the new prophet. He is the new Moses. Let's bring him into what we want him to be as our king. He's fed us. He's healed our sick. And so he must have come to lead us. So they want to make him a king after their own liking, how they desire the king should be. And throughout the Gospels we see now, Jesus is not the king that they are expecting. They expect a king to free them from the oppression of the Romans. But that's not the freedom that Jesus brings. Jesus brings us freedom from sin. He brings us out of our slavery to sin and into the freedom of being a child of God. 
And so he comes to lead the sheep who don't have a shepherd. Now the Gospels relate how Jesus resists the temptation to me, the Messiah, other than the one that is willed by the Father. We see in Matthew and Luke that Jesus is tempted by Satan in the desert. He tests him and challenges him to prove that he is the Son of God by doing what Satan says. The Pharisees, we see, challenge him to produce a sign of his Messiahship. Jesus even calls Peter Satan when Peter rebukes him after hearing that his Messiahship would involve suffering and death. And here again, in chapter 6, verse 15, Jesus resists them, making him king on their terms. Jesus will only be king on the terms of the Father, and as the Father has willed it. Today in our day and age, the church faces a, a similar temptation. But the temptation to be the church today, other than the one willed by the Father, excuse me, the temptation to be a church other than the one willed by the Father by accepting people's criteria of what a proper church should be. The church is often told that you need to modernize your teachings, especially when it comes to sexual morality. The church needs to uh, modernize their teachings on abortion, or same-sex marriage, or the education of children, and many other issues. Many in the world will offer acceptance to the church if the church just does what I want it to do, or what the world says it needs to do. But the church is not ours. It is one holy Catholic apostolic. The church is united to Christ the head. Christ is the one that determines what we believe and has been handed on to us through the disciples, through the centuries. It is not us what dictates the church's belief. It is God himself. So the church must always be willed by the Father. And when necessary, we've seen it through the centuries, the church must suffer ridicule and even rejection as the Lord did. Where the head goes, the body follows. Jesus was persecuted. Jesus suffered. He died. The church, the body, will do the same. And it is only then, it is only then, that the church can be the faithful witness that ultimately leads people to salvation in Christ.